Welcome to the Licensed to Live show, where professionals, doctors, champions, VIPs, attorneys, and those in public office discover strategies that help you restart and gain what is lost when you find yourself accused. If another has doubted your integrity, questioned your credentials, or caused your actions to come under scrutiny, you are in the right place. On the other hand, if you have never felt the knot in the pit of your stomach when legal papers are served, the heartbreak of disappointing your family when the lock clicks shut on handcuffs, or had to appear before a board of review, then be aware, the longer you serve, the more likely you are to find yourself under the microscope of those who judge. Prepare yourself for this uncomfortable possibility. Now, here's your host, Dr. Jarrett Patton. Welcome to this episode of License to Live. My name is Dr. Jarrett Patton, and I'm your host for our journey together today and every day you choose to listen to this show. If you or anyone you know has been dissed in their career, please invite them to join us along this journey. Just go to your favorite podcast player and hit subscribe. And while you're there, please rate this episode and give me honest feedback so I make sure I'm providing you with the most up-to-date information about career challenges and life changes. And on today's episode, we are going to have an interview with a well-known emergency medicine physician, Dr. Wendy Lau. She has a new book that is out right now, and there's so many things you can learn from her pathway in her life that uh, I had to bring her on this show. There's no doubt you are going to feel at ease with some of the decisions you've made in your own career, and we're going to have tips and tools for you to change and enhance your own career. And so we're going to get right into that right after we finish thanking our sponsors. Mm, something smells good. H3 Coffee. H3 Coffee. Premium. Premium Organic. Nothing better than waking up. H3 in your cup. Premium Organic. Hey, this is Dr. Jarrett Patton. Do you need more positivity in your life? No matter what part of your life you want to transform, positive affirmations can help you achieve your goals. But sometimes making permanent changes can be difficult. Designed with you in mind, License to Live, daily affirmations to rebuild your life will inspire and equip you to become the best version of yourself. License to Live, daily affirmations to rebuild your life will set you on the path to changing your mindset, beliefs, speech, and ultimately your actions. You can change your life now by getting your copy at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, your finer book retails, or LicensedToLive.com. That's LicensedToLive.com. The time is now to refresh your career. We help doctors, lawyers, executives, and VIPs refresh and restart. Dr. Jarrett's coaching helps you build confidence, gain more credibility, develop more leadership skills, and gain clarity in your career path. Want to climb the executive ladder or branch out on your own? We'll put your career in overdrive. Visit drjarrett.com and sign up for your free strategy session. Hey guys, this is Janae Noonan and I'm here with Dr. Jarrett on License to Live. Hit the subscribe, follow the journey, let's go. And at any time you want to reach out to me, make sure you're doing it. Just go to Time with Dr. Jarrett and set up an appointment. Simply that easy. I love meeting new people all the time and I am happy to happy to be there at your service. So we have Dr. Wendy Lau on the show today. She's an emergency medicine physician trained in New York City and author of The Inner Practice of Medicine. And within this book, it talks about the inner practice. A lot of it is working inside. So I can't wait to get into our discussion. Thank you, Dr. Wendy, for coming on License to Live today. 
So grateful to be here. Thank you so much for having me on this show. I feel like, like you said, we, I feel like kindred spirits because, you know, I've been reading your book a little and I feel like our books are very similar in the way that it's really putting out our lived experience of, you know, getting through a, 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 an experience of finding our way back to our love for what we do. So, so happy to be here. I, I'm so happy for you to share just some of your stories because I felt the exact same way. And, and when I run across people that are willing to tell a story, willing to do something different, willing to stick, stick their neck out, I love to enhance and amplify the story because a lot of people don't have that strength uh, because we all have struggles in our lives. We all have struggles in our careers. And, and, and it's just a matter of how we address them. And sometimes our own individual struggles will help the masses with the struggles. And I know that was one of the points of your your book that that we will get into. I promise we're going to get into. But I really want to start off talking about Dr. Wendy, the doctor. Uh, I really love to know because as many of you fire starters out there know, I trained at Bellevue and NYU and. I trained at a time where, hey, New York City hospitals really had some stuff going on. And I specifically remember uh, after I was actually called off of call uh, one night, they said, we don't have enough patients. We have plenty of residents out here. Why don't you go home? And by the time I got back to Brooklyn, my pager went back off and they said, uh, we need you to go back because we have a patient in Kings County that we need to bring in. So you're going to have to come back to Manhattan, hop in the ambulance, get over there and, and come back. And so that ended up being a whole nother story that I have to tell you on some other time. But one of the commonalities that Dr. Wendy and I have is that we trained in New York City hospitals, which uh, for those of you that are out there listening and know about New York City hospitals, they are something special if you if you're in any of the city hospitals, for sure. And uh, knowing that I touched one of her home bases at Kings County Hospital is is pretty awesome. But I want to know, why did you get it, get want to go into medicine in the first place? Hmm. Wow. That's one of the things I talk about quite a lot, because I think remembering why we went into medicine in the first place is a great resource because we keep forgetting it. Right. As we're training, if we're taking all the tests, as we're jumping from one hoop to another, we keep forgetting why we're doing this. So that's a great question. Um, I tell people to write down or remember what they sa said in their um, med school application it might be a little far off. But in mine, I remember talking about just wanting to serve, knowing that there's so much suffering in the world, physical suffering, mental suffering. I don't want to live my life without trying at least to serve those people out there who might be going through something. And what better way than serve in medicine? So that's why I went into medicine. And emergency medicine was, I mean, I was a bit of a adrenaline junkie. I told you <laughs> the story that I was actually a kickboxer throughout medicine and emergency medicine just fit right in at that time of my life that, you know, you get all the excitement of different people coming in and you don't know, you don't ever know what's going to happen. But what really drew me to medicine or emergency medicine is that you get to meet people from all walks of life like that I would probably never meet if I just stayed, say, in the Upper East Side or whatever. So that's why I went to Kings County. I wanted to meet all these wonderful people out there and just serve them. Yeah. that That's incredible because a lot of times people want to go into that line of service. You become a servant leader. You become a, uh, a, a physician. You are just doing things because you give. You're giving of yourself, but you're trying to help other people. And sometimes we forget the reasons why we went into any of our occupations in the first place. But most of the time, it's because we wanted to serve. And sometimes along the way, we lose that because mm -hmm. there are so many things that get in the way, whether it's workplace trauma, whether it's just, you know, somebody else had a bad day. Uh, but let alone if you're an emergency physician and you're being repeatedly exposed 
to usually terrible moments in people's lives. And that makes it makes it extremely tough. Now, as the fire starters are going to remember, they remember me bringing on MMA champion Janae Noonan onto the oh, show. Uh, I didn't a little hear bit that of episode of that. yet. Yes. I have to go back and listen <laughs> to that. That's so cool. <laughs> so, so I will put I will put the 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 link in the show notes to make it easy for you guys to go back and hear what Janae Noonan had to say about her MMA career. But I am not letting Dr. Wendy get out of here. Uh, without explaining how she wound up going to her first day on the job in her residency oh, no. with a black <laughs> eye. So, Dr. Wendy, people need to know that oh. that, 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 that tougher side of you. Yeah. And, and, um, and tell us a little bit about your interest yeah. in, in, in uh, kickboxing. Yeah, I I think I started med school uh, knowing that I needed something else than other than just going to class um, to get me through medicine. And I actually started doing yoga, started meditating, and started doing kickboxing all at the same time. I know it makes no sense, um, but uh, I started doing kickboxing because I wanted to a physical activity that is interesting, that challenges me, and it you know fitness. So I started doing kickboxing, but I didn't know that I was going to get that deep into it. So by the time, uh, the end of med school rolled around, I was, I was in there. I was, uh, sparring at the gym. I was, uh, training with the team. I was actually, um, teaching meditation and visualization to the, to the, uh, competitors, um, the ones who actually go and compete. So I'm like, okay, I have two weeks between med school and residency. So maybe I should go to a tournament just, you know, because I probably won't have time in residency. So I went to a tournament in Iowa, uh, in between right that weekend, but before residency started, um, I think I won two fights and lost one, uh, (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> and but I also had a black eye so I went to the first day of residency with a black eye in Brooklyn and all my uh, co-residents and uh, the attendings were like "Ooh, should I should we ask her is she okay is there something at home that's not safe so my introduction when they we were going around in a circle I was just like okay just to get the record straight this is from a sports injury not not you know anything else I'm okay thank you so much for caring <laughs> that is a great story Dr. Uh, Wendy because you know it, one one get the message behind the story folks so first of all you heard her say she needed to know, knew she needed to do something besides simply practicing medicine for how many hours in a week. So she said, OK, I'm going to do some yoga. I'm going to do some other things and I'm going to do kickboxing. Why not? Uh, so so get that message. But then the fact that, you know, it became something as an interest, but really developed into something even more than just a superficial interest uh, to the point where you're competing you know, right before you're supposed to start your day job. So, so I, not I, the <laughs> smartest thing to do. <laughs> well, you, but, but I love it. I love it. That shows some of your spirit, your sense of adventure uh, that, that is clearly written throughout your book. Um, and, and some of the, the ways that you say, hey, this is how I can get my release. These are things that will enhance my overall life. Everything I do doesn't have to be about medicine or seeing patients. I need to do some things for me that are going to make me feel better so that I have the capacity to serve. So so I love that as one of your outlets and in, in your release. So after you were going through your residency, you were you, <laughs> you you dispelled all the rumors of why you had to have a black eye on the first first day on the job. Uh, but as you continued on with your practice throughout the years, was there a pivotal moment in your career when you kind of just said, you know, what what is going on here? Yeah. Well, um, training at Kings County was wonderful. Uh, met so many wonderful people. And that was the best clinical training, of course. As as you know, um, yes. you know, you see all kinds of things that you don't ever see anywhere else. And yes. you really get trained. But 
I was tired. Um, even just even right after residency, I was already starting to go towards burnout. And then I took a job um, in um and in New York City, then I decided mm, I'm only going to work. I, I really want to work locums. So I started doing locums in um, Maine um, so that I have more time outside in nature. I took a job uh, pretty close to Acadia National Park. And so I was like able to work my shifts, go on hikes and then come back wow. and do some shifts. But what really but I was still pretty burnt out. I felt like I realized that, you know, all my other practices, my meditation, my yoga is taking me towards this space of wanting more connection and wanting to be more connected to my path. But I don't feel it at work. I did not feel it at work. I felt like I had two lives that were kind of disconnected. And so there was one night where um, an ICU nurse, uh, a male ICU nurse came into the ED and the co chief complaint on the board said anxiety. And whenever an ED doc sees that, we're like, oh, I feel for you, but what am I going to do? Because there's nothing really we can do. I mean, yeah. you know, what can we do about that? So I kind of went in with a little bit of dread into the room. I'm like, oh, what am I going to do with this? Um, I'm not going to, you know, medicate this person, um, most likely. Uh, I just don't know. And so when I went in, I talked to, I talked to him. He immediately knew, I mean, he's an ICU nurse. He knew he was like, I know there's not much you can do for me here, but I just don't know where to go. My marriage is breaking up. My, I can't really work my job because I have crippling anxiety. I have panic attacks at work. So I have to quit for now. And I just, you know, grabbed the little seat, sat down, which is kind of weird to do in the ED. And just listen to him for maybe 20 minutes. That's a long time in the wow, ED. that is a long time. A right? very, very long time. I mean, luckily that night wasn't super busy. But um, there's just something that really touched me because I myself was also going through starting to feel my burnout. And I was just starting to question, why am I doing this? And how can I connect these two paths, feel into this kind of... Um, compassion that I really wanted to feel but couldn't feel because of burnout. And that was the first time I really kind of felt something um, while I was talking to a patient. So that started uh, a path of really uh, looking for a way of connecting. And that's actually when I found my teacher, um, who is my uh, Buddhist teacher, who actually teaches compassion courses and um, uh, courses about what it means to uh, die and death and loss to clinicians. And so that's how I found her and started on this path of um, going to those courses, but also starting on the path of going to Nepal with her on this medical pil pilgrimage. Wow. Wow. It, it, medical pilgrimage. It, 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 I have to say, uh, throughout my career, one of the things that completely changed my perspective was taking a medical trip to Ghana. Mm. I served in a clinic for about six weeks and mm. it was outside of uh, the capital city of Kumasi. It was in a small kind of remote village and it was set in a hospital, as it was mm. called. But to me, it looked like a ranch house uh, with a garage attached, a cinder block garage attached. That cinder block garage happened to be the surgical suite. Wow. Um, and. As I looked at the things that were going on, uh, when I was being called in to an emergency surgery, me, the least experienced bunch, the farthest thing away from a surgeon, mm. and they said, look, we need you to act as the anesthesia. They drew up a syringe of something. I didn't even know what it was. They just said, slowly inject this into the IV. When he stopped screaming, that's good pain control. If he stops breathing, you've given too much. And those were my ex instructions. <laughs> and that changed my perspective completely on medicine, because of course, here in the US, we have lots of facilities, we have lots of safety measures, we have lots of equipment, testing, things that just make the job so much easier. And it was at that moment in time, when I'm saying that, that I'm 
being the anesthesiologist in this emergency surgery. And I said, oh, my goodness, you know, there's such a world of abundance out there uh, in general, but particularly in the U.S. in our system uh, that, that we've run. So taking a journey somewhere else really changed my life and the way I practice medicine. So you started taking these pilgrimages to Nepal early on. So tell us, tell us about some of your experiences there, because now you're dealing with people, I'm assuming at an incredibly high altitude. um, And it's just a different environment than you were even used to living in. I went on this pilgrimage maybe five times and ended up being one of the co-directors of, of the trip. And it's uh, ran out of the Zen center that uh, I'm at now, uh, Upaya Zen Center. And my actually, my teacher has been doing it for like 40 years. She started going wow. to Tibet, like really high places and taking people there and then realized that uh, the people there has not had any medical care. And there would be accidentally be one doctor on the trip and he would just be working the whole time, um, helping people, treating people, but not having the equipment or the medications that were needed. So then the next year they started bringing more medications and some equipment. And then it just became this trip where she brings uh, doctors from the Western world, Europe, uh, Canada, US, everywhere, um, to these very remote high altitude places, uh, at first to Tibet and then, then to Nepal. Um, so the villages that we go to are actually really high. My friend, one of my co-directors who is a nurse from up there, um, is from a village called Do that's, uh, 13,000, uh, 13,500 feet. So one of the highest villages in wow. the world. So wow. it takes us a while to get up there. The wow. only way you can get up there is by walking. Um, walking? Yeah. So you had we, to walk all the way up there. Yeah. Wow. We started about, uh, there's a village at 9,000 that has a tiny, tiny airport. And it's actually it's very scary. It's a runway between uh, like two uh, cliffs. And so the runway s- starts at a cliff and ends at a cliff. So <laughs> it was a little scary. Scary. Wow. Um, yeah. So we walk up there. We take a month to go to all these different villages. Um, there are different specialties of uh, physicians with us. Also, um, there are we take uh, Nepali physicians and also other practitioners. So we always take a, a traditional um, Tibetan medicine doctor because they trust him, and he's wonderful. He does pulse diagnosis. I don't even know what he does. Um, he touches people's pulses and he's able to tell if they're pregnant or whatever. And I'm like, I don't, I mean, he's accurate too. And we couldn't figure out what he was doing, but he was wonderful in teaching us that kind of slow bedside manner where he's holding someone's hand, looking in their eyes and just really transmitting that kind of care. And so all of us Westerners, Western physicians will, would go into his tent and just watch him, watch this happen and just learn that kind of touching uh, transmission of care. Um, so yeah, we uh, go for a month, we backpack up there, we have some mules that carry the medical equipment, but it, we're out there. Um, that and uh, what we carry is what we have. So sometimes we would, uh, you know, see something that really needs to go down to Kathmandu or a city, and we would fund to to take them down. And that's been really amazing, like cases we've seen and things we've been able to do, um, which has been so touching. That's perfect because anytime I speak with anyone who has just had a little taste, and you've had quite more than a taste of of practicing somewhere else, you just develop an entirely different set of set of skills because, you know, here we're trained to just say, okay, what are your symptoms? What's going on? All right. Check, 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 check. We're going to order off these tests. Check, 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 check. We're going to get this imaging. Check, 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 check. We're going to do this and, and go on down the diagnosis pathway, but other places don't have these resources. So I may be limited to understanding if someone is pregnant or not, and by taking a pulse. So certainly your physical exam uh, uh-huh. skills start to 
be enhanced because, well, you're not leaning so much on all of this technology that that we spend a lot of money on here in in the U.S. and many other Western places. So so I'm sure coming off of these pilgrimages, you must have felt like a a changed physician. Yeah, it's like a a resource. Like we said earlier, remembering why we do what we do is a a deep resource for us. So that is kind of like a reboot every year. And that I was like, it's like kind of like a reset button, you know? Uh, And I was able to come back with fresh eyes and fresh heart and um, try not to get sucked back into my mentality of like just trudging through and remembering why I'm doing this. Um, and, um, I see the same with uh, a lot of the physicians who's came through Uh, many of us who go on something like this has, you know, some thought that they are also, uh, starting to get burnt out. And so it's a great group of people that has gotten so close. We're a community and we're supporting each other through. And, um, in fact, they're coming here, uh, for reunion in October. And I'm just so looking forward to that. And they're all uh, physicians and nurses who really just want to serve in the world and coming on these pilgrimages have helped them continue. Excellent. Excellent. And that's, that, that's how you see the effect multiplied. Yeah. Okay. So, so you're getting benefit. The patients you take care of benefit, the the team members are getting benefit and it, and then multiplies in magnitude so that it's just creating uh, basically goodwill, good energy all around. And in your case, you can bring that back, come back overseas, you come back into the U.S. and you can bring that into your practice so that you can remember why. Uh, and so sometimes, folks, you need to just take a break. You need to get out there and and do something different that gives you a greater appreciation of the space that you stand in today. Uh, yeah. And that's and that's really what we're talking about. So uh, I can't wait to talk about your new book, this inner practice of medicine. You took some time to to write this. And we are going to talk with Dr. Wendy about her new book right after we finish thanking our sponsors. The time is now to refresh your career. We help doctors, lawyers, executives, and VIPs refresh and restart. Dr. Jarrett's coaching helps you build confidence, gain more credibility, develop more leadership skills, and gain clarity in your career path. Want to climb the executive ladder or branch out on your own? We'll put your career in overdrive. Visit drjarrett.com and sign up for your free strategy session. And many of you know, License to Live, the conference has gone past us. But in case you missed it, in case you missed it, go to LicenseToLive.com today. You can get some of the highlights. You can get the entire replay. You can see what you want to see so that you can get another perspective on things you can change in your life. Because a lot of times there's small changes that will help you have greater appreciation for your life, greater appreciation for your career, and give you the ability to serve others in another way. So we're here with Dr. Wendy Lau, an emergency medicine physician uh, and brand new author of The Inner Practice of Medicine, which is a great book. And and thank you for sending me the advanced release uh, copy. So I was able to kind of read through it. And just by reading this book, I already felt like I was beginning to know you and love some of the messaging that that you were putting right up front. Um, and and well, well, tell us what led you to write the book in the first place? Hmm. I think I, I've been kind of writing it in my head for quite a while. <laughs> <laughs> ah, yes. Um, but it was during the pandemic. I moved, I had quit my job right before the pandemic. Um, and then I moved here to Santa Fe, and then eventually to the mountains um, in the cabin um, during the pandemic. I was, uh, I don't know if you remember, during the beginning of COVID, they were calling people to come back to New York, and I was trying to decide if I should go, and quickly realized from my colleagues that it's actually not totally needed. So I was like, okay, how am I going to serve? So I decided to um, open my calendar. I made like, you know, an online calendar, and have people who are ER docs and any docs or anybody who's on the front line of the pandemic sign up for 
30 minute sessions to talk kind of like, you know, what you do, letting people, you know, talking to people. And in those sessions, I was, um, just talking to them about what they are facing, um, at that time. Um, because many of them have families and friends that don't really understand what they're going through and that they can just debrief what they're going through. And we were doing some kind of meditation uh, practice at the end, a lot of times just kind of remembering why we're here and like remembering that whatever we're doing is the best we can do at that moment. Remember in the beginning, we didn't know what we were doing and there was a lot of guilt and shame and it was kind of working through that um, in the session, hoping to you know support them. Somehow I made my way to some kind of list, like free stuff for, um, for healthcare workers. Um, and people were signing up and I was able to talk to hospital pharmacists, um, respiratory therapists, of course, physicians, but all kinds of people who just really wanted to talk. So from that, I was just had all these ideas bubbling up and just started writing. Um, and I just wanted to get out there that even if the environments you work in is difficult or there's systemic change that needs to happen, of course, there's so much, so, so many issues that we're facing right now. But there's something within us that can uh, guide us and help us through and let us find meaning again in this work, even as we're facing the challenges and helping the system change. Absolutely. And, and, and the timing of what you were able to do was, was perfect because, uh, the pandemic was something new for all of us. None of us were really trained and maybe you caught a theory or something somewhere along the way in a public health course. But when you are hit with something so deadly that so the incapacitated so many people so quickly and the science was trying to play catch up, it became very difficult and 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 I could only liken the experience something similar to the experience I had working and living in New York City at the mm. time of 9-11 and how that was just something totally unexpected and very devastating uh, that many people had to live through. And you also, Dr. Wendy, picked out this time saying people need help. People need help with this. And, and it's one thing that we're doing so much to help patients and doing the best we can and and not always succeeding. And many times, uh, I, uh, and, and, and I lost a family member in New York because New York mm -hmm. was one of the, the first hotspots that, that this uh, new illness was going to revolutionize medicine in, in the first place. But that just showed us that, well, yeah, there are lots of victims, primarily from the virus itself. But then the secondary victims are all of these people doing the best they can do to take care of these people. And in the book, you talk about guilt and shame and some of the things that are just kind of inherently within the the system. Uh, and and certainly give us your opinions on on guilt, shame how it lives within us, it's within the system and, and maybe some of the things we can do to uh, alleviate some of that. Yeah. I mean, we're so hard on ourselves um, as a culture, uh, how we were brought up in education that is primarily competitive. So we are so hard on ourselves and especially for all you out there, we call them fire starters. Yes. They are all fire professional. Starters. Yeah. Um, doctors, lawyers, um, all the professional people who have succeeded in this kind of education means that we're skewed towards competitiveness and perfectionism, right? And so it's uh, we kind of treat ourselves like we're workhorses. We just kind of push ourselves through and are, are, and are blinded because we are only just doing the next thing. We're going for it. We're pushing ourselves through. And in that process, a lot of us are so harsh on ourselves and we talk to ourselves in ways that may not be the kindest, right? So we kind of, I, I talk to so many physicians and I ask them, when things are wrong, how do you talk to yourself? What do you say? What is your internal dialogue? And a lot of them have some 
pretty harsh things to say. And that comes from that comes guilt and shame. And so one of the things that I really want people to look at is how they treat themselves within themselves. And also, I think you make a really good point with your book, with the affirmations. I haven't been able to get that book yet because it's on paper only. And I tried to order it, didn't come in time. But from your book, I could hear that like there's you're so upbeat and that that kind of affirmation is what we need um, to kind of overcome this kind of negative bias that we've built up. And as doctors, it's even worse because we're trained to see what's wrong, right? So we are trained to see what's wrong with everyone That's else. It. So we're trained to see what's wrong with ourselves. We're trained to see what's yes. wrong with our relationship. We're trained oh. to see what's wrong with our house or whatever, um, and then we get stuck with what you call the golden handcuffs. And so we just try to perfect everything. And um, we got to give ourselves a break. Please, please give yourself a break. But 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 you're absolutely right, Dr. Wendy. These are the things that are driven from even before you enter med school. Mm. You have to be perfect. You have to have great grades. You have to get high test scores and you have to be an achiever and let alone don't make a mistake. You don't want to make a mistake, but mm -hmm. you don't even know what happens when you do make a mistake because, well, everybody makes a mistake. So we have to try to do things to 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 to, to do all of this. So cut cut yourself some slack at some point on this, folks, because, um, you know, it, it's great to be perfect uh, in, in its own thing. But but that's not the world that we live in. Um, and all the differences or variations that go on, although we want the the best outcomes, uh, there are just some things that that are beyond our control that we're not able to do. And to carry all that that shame or guilt uh, with with your everyday work is 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 exactly what you should do. As Dr. Wendy said, give yourself a break. And I know you talk about this a lot when when you kind of open up the book and. And you're talking about the primary survey. I like I like that mm. because you're using medical terminology in the primary survey. So so lead us lead us through the primary survey uh, and 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 tell us why that's important. Yeah. So in emergency medicine, um, the first thing as interns we learn is the primary survey. Um, you know, A B C D, the airway, the breathing, the circulation. I mean. We know that those are not really totally in sequence when we're actually doing it. But, you know, we need to know, for example, when a trauma comes in, we need to, need to know that they're breathing first before we look for any kind of other injury. We need to know that they have enough blood for circulation. We need to know first things first. Um, what, you know, pardon me, what kills a person first is what we want to look at first and prioritize so that we don't accidentally miss something. So within ourselves, we need to look at what is it that we are bothered with right now? What's the, what's the issue right now? Why are we feeling this way? You know, when I was going through burnout, I had no idea. We were never really taught that. I think the, the, the term burnout and all of that uh, came in the last 10, 15 years. And when I was training, we didn't talk about that. We didn't talk about how we can work with our inner inner uh, landscape. Um, and that's why I decided that I needed all these things because I kind of realized that there's a big part missing in our education. And so the primary survey is really just a way of us taking stock, going inward. What is it that is that we need the most important things that we need right now. Maybe we actually just need to eat <laughs> or, or hydrate. Simple. Simple. Yeah. <laughs> but then what is bothering us about our work and how are we going to um, thrive despite all the things that are happening? We have to deal with the system still. We still have to work within the system that has lots of problems. But how are we going to thrive? How are we going to come back to this place where we're, we're, we know that our our, our uh, intention is to serve out there. How do we come back to that again and again? That, and 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 that's that's what we're talking about. The inner practice of medicine is full of this type of advice. It 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 really even has exercises that you can do for yourself to help you think about where you stand in the, your current space and help you to think forward, building 
resilience, combating moral injury, Mm -hmm. and lots of great things that she packed into this book. So you got to go check it out. You'll be able to find it anywhere. Best books are uh, you buy your books. You'll be able to find it anywhere. (laughs) You'll be able to buy your books. (laughs) Thank you so much. You're absolutely welcome, Dr. Wendy, because uh, again, I think this is a good resource for people who who are struggling out there. And 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 obviously it goes into healthcare quite a bit. But again, it can be across industries because some of these core issues are what people struggle with every day in their own jobs, in their own lives. And you're giving us ways to combat that. So thank you, Dr. Wendy, for adding this book to help us all. Mm, it's my honor. You know, I really just want people to be able to li- live meaningful lives. We've chosen professions that are meaningful, but somehow we've lost that meaning because of the way things are. So let us come back to that. So it's my honor. Perfect. Well, we'll Dr. Wendy, where can people find out more about you? Mm. Um, so I have a website. Is that okay to say? Uh, innerpractice.org. And that links you to some blogs. And uh, I just had an op-ed that just came out in Kevin MD that talks a lot about this kind of stuff. How are we going to thrive um, in, in the midst of systemic problems? Um, and uh, yeah, that's that's the best place to look. And also on social media. And where can we find you on social media? Yeah, uh, on Instagram is Inner Practices because Inner Practice was taken, <laughs> and <laughs> on um, on Facebook uh, you can find me just by searching for Wendy Lau MD. Excellent, you guys check out Dr. Wendy and all that she has to offer. Uh, as as many many mindful experts, as many people who are focused on on their own selves. You're going to learn a lot. And and if you take that introspective look, it's going to help you understand a lot of the things around you. Uh, and then things won't even bother you around you so much uh, <laughs> as a result of that. It, it's amazing how it happens. So thank you, Dr. Wendy, for coming on the show. Is there anything else you'd like to say to our audience today? Love you guys. Fire starters. Go start some good fires. All right, let's do that. Fire starters, let's start some good fires. Thank you. And remember, fire starters, if you or anyone you know has been dissed, disengaged, dissatisfied, disgruntled, disenfranchised with their career, please invite them to join us along this journey. Simply go to your favorite podcast player and hit subscribe to License to Live. And while you're there, please help us rate this episode. Give us honest feedback so we continue to provide you with the most up to date information about career challenges and life changes. And in between episodes, if you want to hang out with me, a lot of times you'll see me on LinkedIn. You'll check out some of the things that I'm doing, some of the things I'm thinking, some of the things that we can't even bring to the podcast. Uh, because we have so many great guests like Dr. Wendy out there. And hey, folks, take some time, work on your own inner practice, and we will see you next time. No matter how disheartening the moment of accusation sounds, how deep the pain of immobilization stabs, or how bleak your future looks, No one can take away your license to live. Keep Dr. Jarrett's expertise handy and unlock your future. Go to Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or another podcast player and subscribe right now to Licensed to Live. See you next time.